Foley from Cross-Eyed Airbrush in Calgary, Canada. I'm here to show you top pro stencil techniques. We're going to teach you how to create your own stencils, and as a bonus, you're going to learn how to use auto air colors. Let's get busy. The first step in preparing this panel is to scuff it down. We really have to get rid of all the shiny surface that we have on here. I'm just using a, a scotch pad and just scuffing up. Now, you can do this with an 800 wet sand as well. All you want to do is just have some bite for the paint to stick to. Anytime you get to an edge, you have to be a little sensitive around the corners and the edges. Quite often you can sand right through your clear and through your base if you're not careful with it. This uh, holds true for any round edges or sharp edges on a tank or a fender or even a goalie mask or a helmet depending on what you're working on. I'm just going to grab some mild wax and grease remover. Any solvent based paint has a wax and grease remover product in its line. The mild stuff is the better with the auto wear colors. So we're just going to wipe it down here with a little bit of it. This is going to remove all the fingerprints and contaminants. Paint could have stuck to it if you had it in the shop. You just want it nice and clean to work with. We're just going to wipe it on here and wipe it off. This doesn't have clear coat on it, so we're going to pull a little bit of black off with it. I like to have it all sealed up with clear, preferably. But once we get this wiped off, we'll hit it with the same process with the mineral spirits as well. This will take off some of the chemicals from the wax and grease remover. We're really striving to get the cleanest surface possible to start with. We're just applying mineral spirits now. Shoot a bit on there and we give it a wipe down. Similar process, wipe it on, flip your rag around, drag it off. This pulls off all the contaminants. You can air dry this, let it naturally dry. I usually sometimes just grab the airbrush with no paint, just air. It dries off really quick and we can shelf this so we can start on the next part of this project. I brought myself a really good reference here. This is out of the Atlas of Human Anatomy for Artists. It's a classic book. It's been out for a lot of years, and it's still the Bible for skeletons and skull reference. I have photocopied a few references, both from front and profile. Today we're going to deal with the profile version. I've done a few copies. It's really good to study what you're going to paint. Know it from all angles. And I could probably paint this guy inside out without reference, but every time I tackle a skull, I still have this out. Even if I'm mutilating it and kind of morphing it into something else and making it more evil by changing brow ridges, and we'll get into how we're going to modify it because we're going to draw our own based on this. Here's our profile right here, and this is going to, what we're going to use for the main part of our reference. And it's really good to surround yourself with really cool stuff. Understand it before you modify it. A lot of guys get into modifying a skull and changing stuff and they really don't know what they're doing. They put a big tooth in the middle of his mouth or they put 17 teeth or something and it really looks odd unless you manipulate it right. You can tell the guys who manipulate a skull properly to the guys who don't really understand it. I brought a couple copies because we're going to make an elaborate stencil system and we're going to cut some stuff out and I'm going to show you how to do it both from reference and from our own drawing. This is a little copy of just one that I used in a prior project. They're very simple. We're just cutting out positives and negatives. So we're going to draw our own and I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about making your own stencil. Since we're starting with a profile of the skull, and we're going to modify this guy, all I do is draw on photocopy paper. I buy it by a thousand at a time. It's really cheap, easy to work with, easy to cut out. This is my stencil material, just a photocopy paper, but you can work in a mylar. Make sure you test it, though, that uh, solvent-based paint or water-based paint doesn't affect it. Sometimes the plastic can melt with solvent base. So you got to get the right stuff to cut up, and that makes your stencil reusable a lot more. I can still use a paper stencil four or five times, but it's nice to make it individual for each client. Sometimes you reuse them when you have clusters of hundreds of skulls, and this can be used not just for a skull. You can be using it for a dragon or a dog or anything you want to draw. But the reason I'm going to redraw it, I could cut this out and use this one, but I want to modify this guy and make him a little more evil. I want this guy to come from hell. So we're going to really evil this up. And we're going to put some background glowing off of him and play with lighting on this guy too. So there's a couple ways we can go about this. We can slide these guys together and get on a light table. Or even now I can still slightly see the outline. And we could loosely draw the outline right now if we wanted to. Let's just do that right now. We'll just put it into what a stock one is. And this is what I call a stock skull. Stock skulls are very close to anatomically correct. 
and then we're going to modify them and you can kind of super stock it just like your drag racer. I'm just using a very light pencil line here just mapping out the major points of this skull. It'll be easy to see over top of this how I'm going to modify it. That'll be good for educational reasons. Again, I think it's very important to know the stock skull before you modify them. And I'll just darken it up a little bit so you can see this well. We'll erase it later. And I'm just throwing in the major points here that we have. All the zygomatic arches and brow ridges. And it's nice to memorize what each feature of this skull is. And then we can show you how to modify them so we can make them a little more evil. You can put a lot of expressions. It's just like a human. You can make them sad. You can make them happy. You can make them laugh. You can do a lot of things with these skulls if you know how to modify them. And it's just like a caricature almost. Even though you're painting it realistically. So there's our, our stock skull. Now I can start drawing just from scratch. I've drawn thousands and thousands of skulls, but if you're new to skulls, sometimes a tracing might help you. And that's not really cheating. That's just understanding what you're doing. So the first thing that I like to do in a modification, I like to slope the skull back. So I'm just going to pull his brow ridge out and make it a little more evil. I usually cut down the cranium a little bit. He has a fairly big top cranium. If you cut this back, he just gets a little eviler and a little more streamlined. The brow ridge is really important, especially on a front version of one. If you can already see, he looks a little bit faster. Now the eye socket. This is probably the hardest part of dealing with a modifying a skull, is trying to get this eye socket to look really evil. Again, from the front, it's really obvious how they work. This eye socket right here, it's kind of droopy almost. I'm just going to recreate this really quickly. That's kind of the stock eye socket. This would be our nostril hole or cavity. Now, what I want to do is I want to make this guy really nasty. I want him to really pierce you. I want him to stare you down and scare the hell out of you. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to modify him a little bit. By doing this, it just gives him a nice piercing look. Now that eye hole has been modified to a point where he's very piercing. Now you can add an eye in there if you really wanted to. You can do the same, the very same thing with the nostril hole. You know, you can turn him into a nasty cavity like this and all of a sudden he gets more aggressive and more stout and it's almost like they're attacking. And that's what we're going to do to the side profile of the skull. We're going to make him attacking. Okay, what we're going to do is try to modify this eye socket. And what we have to do is kind of replace it a little bit. Put that evil high brow ridge in there. The eye socket's moving up and around and back and forth, mainly up and back. So we're going to cut this down. And keep in mind it gets foreshortened a little bit from a side profile. Now this might work quite well. Let's just darken that in a little bit. We might modify this again if we don't like it. But now... This crowning on the top of the arch above the eye has now gone right through the eye socket. So we have to modify this. By streamlining the skull, we might actually even bring it back a little bit further now because I have to modify this brow ridge. Now the brow ridge is going to come in like so. We're using existing shapes, but I'm trying not to modify it too much. Like I'm, I'm modifying the shape, but we're going to still make sure it exists in our skull. And I think this is a zygomatic arch. We're going to just modify that a little bit and bring it up. See the angles approaching up a little bit higher than the stock one. The cheekbone can be modified a lot of different ways. If you give him a high cheekbone, he has this more of a sinister grin to him. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to chisel this out so it looks a little more evil and sinister. Now I've repositioned this and now he's a little more evil. You can uh, punch him up even higher if you like. Like we could start this guy up here punch him in, bring this guy down a little lower, and even by doing that, he's getting more evil. So let's erase that initial line. And erasing is not a bad thing. God, I redraw stuff sometimes 15, 20 times if I'm not liking where it's going. And there's nothing wrong with that. Each time, you're supposedly trying to improve on it and make them better. If it takes you 15, 20 times, no big deal. Let's have a go at this nose now. The nose kind of swoops down. Sometimes if you do a short one and cut it in a little bit, like right in here, I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to chisel out that nose a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Now just by cutting out that little piece of bone in there, he all of a sudden has a little more aggressive look. I like to shorten up the noses quite often too. That gives them more of an evil look. So let's uh, exaggerate it on the drawing. Here we go. Bring that down a little bit. We just pound it up 
bring it in. There's a nice little crack there. If you make that crack nice and evil, bring his nose cavity in. And look at how high I'm going with this nose cavity now. Now, everybody gets a really unique style to how they want to do it. And I try to do them different every time. But I know there's a lot of flavor to the skulls that I do. And they tend to look somewhat alike over time. And then it's up to you to try to push it and change it a little bit. And sometimes that's tough to do when you do thousands of them. So let's bring this down. And we're going to now deal with the top of the roots and the top of his roof of his mouth. They're in line with the top of the tooth. Usually the crown comes up. And this is where you can see amateur guys that don't understand skulls. They get these all crooked and they're really not understanding what's going on. And that's why you need a book like this to really understand it. And I like to push the jaw out a little bit. It makes them a little more aggressive. And there's a little bump and you can see that on the reference. Usually just right above one of the roots. And then we'll start into a teeth line. Now the teeth. There's another thing. You can modify those like crazy as well. You can put sharp ones in, fangs in, incisors. You can do a lot of things to modify them to make them look more nasty. We'll just modify a few of them. We'll keep a few of them stock and then crack them up. Now keep in mind you're dealing with perspective. As the teeth roll around the jaw, treat them like little chiclets. They're going to get smaller as you get around the side. So the front ones you're barely going to see. They might just be slivers. And as they open up into your viewing distance, they're going to get bigger. If we go back to the drawing, we can see that this is very simple. They're very thin there. They get a little bigger, bigger, bigger as you go across. You, they're just opening up, and that gets it to curve around, and you're dealing with perspective. So back at our drawing, we're just going to draw a few of these in here, and let's erode them a little bit and make them a little sharper. And then we'll deal with the big incisor. And this guy, he's always the fun one to do. Yeah, let's not go too big. It's easier to go big with him when his mouth is open, but if you go too too big with him right now when his mouth's closed, they end up butting each other. He'd actually never be able to close his mouth if we did a, a three-inch dagger fang off of him. And then let's just throw in the four molars. Keep in mind, I, I like to be particular. I like to have the right amount of teeth in my skull's mouth unless he's had a few of them knocked out after drinking in the bar. So that's quite possible. I see them all the time there. So here we go. We got some nice sharp teeth in there. And let's just open his mouth a little bit. We'll start this lower jaw. The lower incisor quite often closes in the mouth unless he has an overbite in front of the in other incisor. So we actually got to put this guy up front a little bit more. And as you open the jaw, the jaw has to tilt down. So let's reflect that in the drawing. Shortening the chin is really a good thing too. It really makes them a little more evil when you shorten them up. There's lots of ways to draw this, and I'm not liking this one, so I'm going to start again. It's that simple. It's nice to follow these lines, and if you accentuate them a little bit and exaggerate them a little bit, sure, it gets a little cartoony, but if you paint it in high rendered like our reference is here, it's going to look really cool anyways. It's up to you how much you want to exaggerate them. The more you exaggerate it, the more your rendering has to look really, really tight and professional to make them look real. I like to really stretch this top of the jaw, too. Stretch them out. And then let's just deal with the rest of these teeth. Now, have a good look at this. And I'm, I'm looking for problems right now. I'm thinking this jaw is looking a little funny around the chin. So I'm just going to soften that up a little bit. Get rid of my prior drawing. And just revalidate that second copy of it. He looks a little bit better now. Now, if you want to get more evil, all we do is start tweaking it even more. We start carving up into it a little bit more. And all of a sudden, he's starting to get more evil. Shorten up his cranium a little bit. You know, if you want to open his mouth, give him bigger teeth. All of a sudden, he starts looking a little bit more nasty. You know, we can carve this up even a little bit more. And the more I modify it, the more I'm finding this skull is just going to get a little more evil. Now, we're coming out with a stencil kit. We've inked a few of them out now, and they're going to go into production in the future. And I've done a bunch of them, and I started a sheet of, like, hot sheets that are just like how I work with stencils. And some of them are really modified. Some of them are stock. Some of them are evil from hell. And I think they're going to be a lot of fun. And I'd like to really see those made because I'll actually use them in my own shop because they're going to be a lot better quality than what I make for myself. 
are going to be in a nice mylar plastic composite that isn't affected by solvent paints. So I'm just tweaking little lines here until I'm really kind of getting happy with them. I'm just going to chisel this out a little bit more. Just by putting that little point on there, he looks a little bit nastier. I think his brow ridge is a little high right now. So I'm doing a lot of modifying, but I mean, this is how this is how it works. And you're going to even maybe spend a little more time than me doing this, possibly. But be picky with yourself. You know, look for ways to really modify them and make them cooler and nastier. So he's not looking so shabby right now. There's probably a lot more we can do with this, but I'm kind of happy painting what we have right now. Identify parts of the skull. This is really good to have this reference. There's little cracks where plates in the skull have come together and little, they call them fossas, I believe. And uh, what they are is where blood and artery veins feed the face and they pop out. I like to really accentuate those. That's one of the bigger ones that feeds your face with blood. I can put a crack in here. There's a few cracks that come off the nasal cavity up into the forehead. And the more you push these, the cooler they are. You can throw bullet holes into them, crack them up, erode them. There's lots of things you can modify. Throw some big nasty horns. You know, half his head could be missing. You can do a lot of cool stuff with them. But we'll keep this guy just the way he is right now. And we're going to really play with the lighting when we get to spraying them. Okay, now that we've got a nice outline, this isn't a really effective stencil until we have positive and negative shapes involved. So now we have to make this shape work. Uh, we have to cut it out so systematically our darks pop out. What we're going to do is cut out a complete outline. This way we can lay it down on the panel, spray our whites from our negative sheet, then lay our positive in and spray our dark shapes. So I'm starting to make my shapes. I know this eye is going to be a slam dunk. It's really easy to cut out and get right. So our stencil stays together. It's nice to have some bridge areas. And what I call a bridge area means if I draw this now and connect this up a little bit, like so, and get rid of this, our stencil will hold together more because we have connector areas. So by connecting this with that, this comes out nice and easy and we don't lose the lower jaw. It won't fall off on us. Now this is only one approach. Cutting out a stencil is one approach. I could go in with a chalk pencil and draw right on the tank and start freehanding. But then you lose everything. If you get bad spray and stuff, you can't find where your teeth are anymore if you've messed it up. So this is really a good process for the beginner. I know a lot of guys can really work from a chalk drawing. They can draw right on the tank and go. But they don't lose their whites. They don't obliterate it with their blacks and wreck the project. So this one, if you start to wreck it, you can go back in and work it. So let's create some more holes here. This jaw is looking a little low. So I'm going to redraw my drawing it just a little bit. And this is going to have to be a dark shape. So we'll just tone this in right now. This is a good shape right here. This might be a good place to do a connector right here too. It keeps our stencil really working well for us. And these are just going to be mapped in really, really lightly at first so we know where everything is. And you've got to kind of trust me a little bit that this is a... This is a real simple system once you figure it out. We're back to our reference here, and there's a really nice shadow in behind this arch. And that'll create depth, because it's creating a cavern that rolls underneath. So now we've got to create an artificial one for ourselves. So I'm going to come down this ridge, and I'm just going to cut out our shadow for that same shape. And this is pretty simple if you know what you're doing. It just takes a little bit of time to know what you're doing. Okay, so now we've got one, two, three, possibly four shapes cut out here. We've got a nice natural one already in the outline. We're going to need a shadow underneath this. And here again, we need a little bridge just to keep our stencil together. And it's nice to give yourself about an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit more. Because if you cut through that, then things will fall apart and you're forced to go back in and tape them up. And that takes some time. We're just going to pull down and deal with our root connections. Now these are the little valleys between the roots that we were talking about earlier. So I bring those down in between, like this. And this will be one shape. This is going to create a shadow right underneath our cheekbone. And it's also going to define where our shadows are. And when we go to spray this, we'll spray this dark at the top and just fade it out. Now, teeth are really tough. 
it's so easy to overspray your teeth. You get them nice and white, and then you go in and you tone them into shapes, and then you kind of lose them. Sometimes you spray the skull so much that you end up getting overspray on it. I like to do a second stencil usually for the teeth quite often just to save it. So sometimes I'll run to a photocopier after I've done this drawing and I'll run off two, three copies of it. And then I can just cut out my teeth separately and use that as a positive to go back in. So multiple stencils are a good thing. Right now we'll just cut out a little bit of a sliver and map out where the cracks are or the top of the gum line. Again, I'm going to stop right here and leave a gap. If you can see right here, if I start it right here, then you can run it around to most of the teeth. Now this has to have some dimension to it. So I just cut out a little sliver and let it end. We'll do the same thing on the bottom too. And color them in, you know where we're going to cut. You can get as far as putting shadows around everything. There's another fossa right here that's really cool. On most skulls you'll see it. Oh, there he is right there. I like to stretch them out sometimes. Instead of making it look just like a hole, I kind of aerodynamic them up a little bit. You know, stretch them out. He's kind of neat and nasty. He gets this nice flow of aerodynamics to him. I'm quite comfortable working from this right now. If you feel you need more information and you want to put a little more darks in it and you think it helps you, then go ahead. But this really is good enough to work from and your natural talent of what you're seeing should carry you through the rest over time. I took a little break here to grab a photocopy of this so we have two copies. This copy right here we're going to cut out an outline for. So I'm just going to cut out the complete outline following all the teeth throughout and around. So here we go. The main reason for doing this system is the flexibility that it provides the artist. You can go back in and revalidate your colors and your highlights so easily. You want to keep your blade straight, by the way. Hold your paper down because you can tear when you cut. There's a pile of benefits to this. A client lays down his bike a year and a half later. If you file this properly, you can go back and you can look through, find it, and redo it. So I keep a file back or an envelope of every project that I work on. And if I have a stencil or a drawing for it, then I save it so I can reutilize it. And you'd be surprised how many bikes get dropped and projects get damaged over the course of say five years. These cuts around the teeth right now. I'm just trying to make sure I have enough space between them and the top so my stencil holds together. It's going to be a little bit difficult to pop this out. We might have to recut a few little corners and edges where my knife didn't quite get through. So now we're going to pull this out. Now this is going to be really, we've got to be careful around here because you can tear this paper quite easily. So popping this out is going to be a little bit of a trick, especially if I cut, you, know, you can already tell I didn't cut into this corner very well. I usually just use a knife blade to hold it down. There we go. Now, if we had bent this or tore it, we'd have to tape it up and then re-register it so it's not on the wrong angle, because then the other stencil won't line up for us. So this gives us a complete positive. This is what we call the positive. This is what we call the negative. Okay, what we have now is our positive in front of us. Now we have to deal with our secondary dark areas. Now we have a second stencil cut out. I'm going to show you the beauty of this situation. This is what we'll get when we make our stencil kits. When those come to market, they're going to be a two-part system. And this gives us the flexibility of working on light surface and dark surface because it's a two-part system. I like this flexibility because I can reuse that stencil on another project. So if I can cut it out for dark, I can use it for light as well just by using different colors. So I'm going to show you a light flexibility, like how it can work on white paper, and then we'll do it on our dark panel. I got ahead of the game here a little bit, and we can see this really quickly on black. I've cut out these sections already for us, save us some time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to map it out on this white piece. And this is real simple. We can take our positive out, and sometimes the paper curls a little bit. Just fold it back. And the secret to this is really spraying it lightly. So I'm going to grab my airbrush, and I do a little practice spray out just to make sure it's working. And keep this really light because you're going to really modify your background color around the outside of the stencil. And if you want to keep this really light and still have a mapping for it, your background might be red and you want it red, then spray red now. For now, this all we need is the black. And this is where those weights would come in handy. If you just lay something like this on it, 
that's keeping down my teeth. So I'm, I just use my fingers most of the time, but you could, if you have a flat surface, you can lay some nuts or those penny rolls that I was telling you about. And just chase the outline around. I'm going to go a little bit darker here just so you can kind of see it. But sometimes going really light, depending on what your background is, you have to reconsider that before you do it. So really plan out how you're going to approach this. So we'll pull this off. All of a sudden, we have a really nice outline of it. The next step is pulling in our second cut with all our negatives. Now this is going to be a little bit, this is going to prove to be a little bit more difficult in the fact that we have to register these lines. So you got to somehow match up where all these cuts are. And that's not always the easiest way to go. Now I cut back a little bit in here so I can kind of see my line. That's a bit of a, it's not a cheat, but I mean, it's a good way to start to register your teeth. That's important in this process because if you don't register it, everything's going to be misaligned on you. So now what we're going to do is map in our negative areas. Now this negative area can go fairly lightly or fairly dark. If you want a big cavity in the eye and you want it all dark, then you can pound it a little harder. This area, I would just lighten up the dark area inside so you can feather it out. Because in our reference, that shadow kind of fades out gently. If you create a really harsh line on this edge, then it's going to be difficult to get rid of it. The underside of this usually has a fairly dark shadow. Again, we want a light shadow underneath that without creating a secondary line. Underneath the jaw is going to be heavily dark. The roots going in between the, the root valleys in between the teeth are going to be generally light top of the teeth are going to be a little bit darker than the top edge of it. Again, same on the bottom. These fossa holes, fairly dark in the middle, fading out. And that is a simple mapping. We pull it out, we have a skull to start going on. You have a complete project ready to airbrush, and you can just go in and start freehanding. You know, determine where your light source is. You know, if you're starting one, I like to draw a little arrow on it or point where I want my light. So if light's coming down that way, then I know that my shadows are going to be on the bottom side of everything. My highlights are going to be high up there. We didn't create a good or a bad line at all along here, so I can fade this out nice and naturally. Shadow on the long side of it. And you can just go in and start freehanding this thing and finish it. Okay, what I've done here is I've uh, put my negative stencil down I moved them around on the panel to where I like them. I'm going with a vertical format. And I tilted the skull ahead a little bit, moved them to where I wanted, made the placement I like. I've laid down this. I've taped off my back areas. I'm just using a transfer tape. It's very low tack. It doesn't leave any adhesion. It doesn't modify or leave any glue residue. So that's really nice. I've changed my paint into a white. And I'm going to just slowly blend this in there. Just keep my edges down nice and sharp so I don't get any underspray underneath. I'm going to try to keep that fairly minimal. So I just like making light passes to start. And with Auto Air, Auto Air works on a principle of a lot of light passes. This gives it adhesion. It gets a kind of a cross-hatching bond. Now, right here, I've put this little nut in here, and you can see that it's just holding and registering where I want the teeth to be. So I'm going to work the front edge of this first, then I'm going to pull it off and move it to this side, then spray the back edge. I still get a little ghosting from it, but it's better than this thing moving around. I'm going to put a little bit more white into the teeth. I'm going to concentrate on that, because the teeth are usually the brightest part of the skull, with the exception of maybe the highlights on the reflection on the bone. I spray slightly away from the edge if I can. And what this does is it prevents a little bit of the bleeding through or the bleeding under. But figure out your project right from the get-go. I like to write out my steps of each project. Sometimes there's 10 steps, sometimes there's 15, sometimes there's three. And really think about the most efficient way to go through this. So walk your mind through the project before you start. I've picked a light source up top from this corner. That's going to be my main light source. So right now I'm already trying to consider how bright I want it. I want it brighter on the front than I do on the back. So there's not much sense for me putting in a lot of white in this back corner if the light isn't going to hit it. I'm just continuing to build up these highlights. 
take your time with this process. This part of it is important. Uh, if you get it on too thick and the way I have it thinned out, it's easy for the paint to skate. And what I mean by skating is if you spray it too thin, it gets a nice dot pattern, but if it gets on too thick with a thin mixture, what it'll do is it'll kind of like beat up, almost like almost like when you work with crayons in elementary school. You used to put a wash over it, like a watercolor wash, and it used to beat up. Well, that's kind of what the paint does on the surface if you have it mixed too thin and you spray it too heavy. But I like to spray really thin. It keeps my overspray down and it keeps the dot pattern down, which means it atomizes a little bit better and the paint pigment is a little bit finer. And that's been a problem a lot with uh, auto wear colors. People don't know how to thin them out properly. And using this mixture really sort of dissolves the paint a little bit, I feel, and makes it flow a lot better. This is an HPC by Wada. It's a 0 0.03 nozzle and needle. You know, it's a brush that I use most of the time. I really enjoy it. But like anything, they're finicky. They can have problems like anything. They're mechanical. So you have to keep them really clean and always carry spare parts for them. I've broken down my brush a little bit. I like that cap off of there. I like my needle to be exposed. I can see it. And if I do get paint on it, I can slowly pick it off. I, do, I run without a lid. I don't put a lot of paint in my hopper. I strip the back handle. I don't even know why it's there. I also have added a nice clean out, an air clean out, so it cleans out your system. I press that quite frequently, and you can see if you have any moisture in your line. It also gives me a little bit better grip. I don't have to press so tight to hold my airbrush, which actually puts an indent in your finger as you squeeze too much, and your, ti your hand will tire out over time. This way I can kind of compress it with my other fingers, and it makes it a little bit easier to hold. Okay, we've got this all peeled off. We're going to do a background in here as well, and this might create some underspray, so we'll have to lay the positive back over this so we can spray some background in. Okay, I've got the positive back in my hand, and I'm laying this over top of what I have. I'm going to spray some white background in because I'm going to put some special effect colors from AutoAir on here that are really kind of cool, but they, they're a very translucent paint, so they need a white background. So I could actually spray the white first all by itself, and that's fine, because it's, it's just going to make my skull brighter. Okay, we have a really nice assortment of nuts here. What I'm doing is just putting some weight on here so the air doesn't move it around, and we'll prevent the underspray. And a nice heavy one right there. Just like kids with building blocks. I'm grabbing my white right now. I filled it up a little bit more. My cup's about half full <laughs> or half empty. And I'm going to put in some background right now. I'm standing for this process because I like to work around my project. I'm going to do a lot of movement here. So position yourself at the ideal height. Make your studio space the best you can. Move around your project so you're getting an ideal angle of approach on this. We want to create a warm glow from underneath, so I'm just going to create a really soft, kind of cavernous hell smoke that kind of resembles a little bit of a blurry flame from a distance. So let's just start spraying now. You can already see that that front jaw is starting to pop up. See how I give it air? So I'm going to reposition one right now. I'm going to add a big guy down there. So right now, I'm just going to drift off some smoke like he's running into it a little bit. And this is, this is really subjective. I'm just winging this right now. You may want to get some smoky reference or flame reference in front of you or something from, you know, a magazine you've seen or a photo you've taken of your own. I like to compile my own reference when I can. But, I mean, some of these magazines are amazing. This could have come out of a car magazine for a product shot. You know, I clip a lot of stuff just to help myself. Gives you a lot of new ideas, and you're just tweaking it and reusing it in a different format. There's nothing wrong with that. Just try not to copy it straight out. Now, what I'm doing here is just building this up really slowly. The brighter that I put the areas, that'll be the hot spots. Now, I've been spraying for a while. My tip is clogged up a little bit, so do a little spray out or pick off the tip. Be very cautious around your needle. Your needle's expensive. I go through them like crazy because I spray with the cap off. I probably change two or three of them a month. 
but I'm I'm spraying daily with it, so you know I I call that the cost of working. You can see how I'm holding my airbrush right now. It's kind of a little unorthodox. Everybody has a little bit of a different grip for it. I like to cup my hand, and what that does is a, I call it triangulation, and it takes a shake out of your hand. It really steadies your hand, and you can kind of pivot it. I'm going to want this a little bit warmer at the bottom, so I'm going to. I'm going to pound some colors in there that are just a little bit brighter. I'm going a little heavy here. This is where spraying on an angle is really important. So we can turn this a little bit. Now we're spraying away from it and we're not disturbing our stencil. You can spend a lot of time on this step if you want, if you really want to work it out. Or you can just wing it like I'm doing and see what you get. And I might even hit it with a bit of a light source on it. If I do that, I can just put a little bit of streaking in it and it'll look like lights hitting it pretty heavy. I'm just going to pass this right through them a little bit on this side and then I'll leave a shadow on the other side of it that will cast on it. So I'm really thinking ahead three, four steps. I've got the whole project kind of worked out in my mind even though I'm really kind of winging it. Okay, what we're going to do now is I've repositioned the project. So I'm going to spray away from my stencil and I even loaded a few of the nuts to the top. Now what I've gone in with is a new color called Sparklescent Tequila Yellow. So I'm going to spray it into my warm areas, which is my brighter white areas. And I'm just going to let this fade out really hard. I'm not worried about too much overspray at this point. We're going to go in with some orange and we're also going to go in with some red and see what kind of special effects we can get here. I'm spraying fairly far back too. Just going over top of every area that I had put in, a really bright area. Keep in mind right now everything's relatively in a matte finish and you're going to follow this up with a solvent based urethane clear. This stuff is just going to come alive. It's going to shine and sparkle and glisten and it's going to look really sexy. I'm just looking in my hopper here and I have a really cool color in there. This is Sparklescent Mango. It looks like you could eat it. It's pretty tasty. I just did a hot rod in a color very close to this. This is going to be fun to spray. And again, I'm just going to work into the bright areas again. I'm going to keep my brightest areas yellow. I'm really liking this right now. This is a beautiful color. Now, if these are going to react to anything like the candies and some of the other special effects, I find that there's a bit of a bridging gap between red and orange, and I quite often like to mix the two together. So I'm going to pick up my next color and I'm going to crossbreed them and do a mid-tone between the two. Okay, I'm going to go with my Sparklescent Mango. I'm going to add about half-half right now. And the new color that I'm going to add is Sparklescent Rockstar Red. And I'm going to go about half-half. That's about right. I've got my mixing brush here. I'm just going to quickly swirl that together. And I'm just going to incorporate this into my dark caverns a little bit and slowly blend it in. This is sort of the typical artist's approach. You get into it and nothing that comes out of the tube is totally perfect so you end up crossbreeding a lot of your colors. Again I'm still spraying away from my project and I intentionally designed this so that I don't have to go really close to my work. If I can stay away from it in most spots, that's going to make my job a little bit easier right now. And it's starting to look a little bit like a flame, and I wasn't really trying to intend that, so I'm going to even it out a little bit more so it doesn't quite look as flame-like. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go back to my Sparklescent Mango, and I'm going to level it out a little bit with more orange. Quite often I carry a hair dryer with me right next to my workstation so that I can spray these and dry them off. It makes my next step or my next pass of colors that much more effective. I've looked at this pretty closely and I've lost a little bit of my cavern areas. So I went into a detail black, thinned it out quite a bit. And I'm going to rock back in here and just create some cavern holes back in. And this is a great opportunity if you want to get really nasty and evil. You can carve out some hidden faces in there and things lurking from the background. I can put a little skull in here right now just in a second. And this face will just be really, really subtle. And again, I want to go back into my area. It's probably the black is dried now. And I can go back in and start to cover up my mess ups a little bit more. I'm back into my hot rod spark lesson here. I'm doing a pure mixture now. And I'm just going to take it from the darkest areas of red that I have already and slowly blend it into my black. And I'm going to spray from a fair big distance. I want this to be really blurry. I'm just going to repeat this probably two, three times until I kind of like my colors. The more you pound this, the more you saturate the paint on here. It seems like the richer it's coming out. 
Okay, we left this area at the top, and this is where I anticipated going in with the blue. And the blue is a sparklescent nightmare blue. I want to saturate this fairly dark, except for uh, my highest beams. So I'm going to kind of stay away from these sort of light radiating beams and work it from the outside in. And this is going to go straight over black over here, so it's going to just be this really deep midnight blue over there. And it should come alive as soon as we hit this white. So now I've mixed up just a little bit of warmer mixture, and I'm working this into my light beams. And this is bringing out a lot more blue. Beautiful. This is nice. Well, we finished up this background now. We gave it a little bit of time to dry, so we're not going to put any fingerprints in it. Now it's time to pick off all our nuts and see what we have here. So be very careful with this process. We don't want to drop one on here and cause a scratch. Let's see what we have. There we go, we have a white skull, and we're going to have to go with our black stencil cutout and head on to the next step. Okay, we've got to lay our dark stencil back in. We haven't mapped out the eyes or any of shadows now. What we've done now is we've mixed up a little bit of brown. We're going to avoid all the sparkle essence from here on in, if we can help it. And we've mixed a brown root beer with uh, some gold, which is kind of a yellow, and a bit of black. I've got a nice cool shadow color is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to come up about a quarter inch from the bottom here. I'm just going to gently blend this in really good for us here. I'm just going to knock in where my shadows are going to be. This will tap in that bridge area. And I'm going to be really tight there because I have a tight line around that. There's a little bit of a highlight usually on top of the jaw. And this would be a really good opportunity to get my reference back out. And even though it's not the same drawing, it's the same pose and we'll see some shape here. Now that we have it nice and close, we can really see the shadow. Underneath, you can see how this is totally lost. We can actually go in a little bit harder over here and finish it off that way. Now I'm going to take every shape and isolate each shape and kind of define how the light is going to hit it. I just kind of pretend that that shape is a certain texture, a certain look, a certain movement, a certain flow to it. And I analyze all this as I go. So if it's bone, it's going to have some shine to it and some highlights. If it curls around like a sausage or like a finger, I try to emulate that and just try to visualize how my light source is going to bounce off of it. Find if you go with a lighter color at first and just build it up three or four passes, you get a little more control with it than hit and just with a solid black and away you go. This will give you a lot more control in the long run. It's important to mention that every time I take an area, I'm really considering how far I want my brush away from the painting. If I'm in really tight and I want a sharp line, then I have to be in close. If I want a nice gentle fade, I'm out further back. I usually always spray on an angle. I like to spray away from myself and away from the highlight that I'm trying to save. So if I got to keep this bright on the top edge of this arch, I'll start with the air first, then I'll start to slowly pull back. I've remixed my mixture again, going to a little bit more of a yellow. I'm still trying to save all my white highlights. This creates a nice luminosity. Okay, I went with a little darker color right now. What I'm doing is just chiseling out little cracks and we'll see if we can get some detail in here. These lines take a little bit of concentration, so I get a little quiet. Usually the tongue comes out. There's a little bit of a shadow or a crown that rides just above the tooth, just before the root starts. I've been working away at this for about 15, 20 minutes. So what we've done is we've added a little bit of cracks. We've toned out a little bit. I'm just noodling away, just puttering at it, finding spots that need some darkness, and throwing in some cracks every once in a while. Okay, I've jumped ahead about another 10 minutes on you here. And now I've gone in with a little darker mixture. A couple drops of black into that sepia yellow color we had. And now I'm just going to start chiseling this out a little bit darker. And I like to freehand this part. I could go back in with a stencil if I wanted to in some of these areas. But right now, softening that edge just slightly is going to be a nice feature for us. It'll get rid of that stencil look just a little bit, so I'm just chasing that line, fading it out. Looking for my really dark areas now. It isn't a bad thing to actually partake in one of the getaways, too. The getaways are an amazing learning experience. 
the Airbrush Action Getaways, there's three of them a year. They usually do two in Vegas and one in Charlotte, North Carolina. There's a variety of courses you can take. There's about six or seven courses if you like pinstriping more than airbrushing, if you like graphics more. Whatever you feel you have an affinity to, then you sign up for that course. I go down there to teach and I come back with as much information as I gave to everybody else. I learn off students, off the other instructors, and I come back inspired. There's guys that have complete breakthroughs at these programs. It's very real. Stuff like this isn't offered too much. I started doing my airbrushing. I had to learn in a, my own little isolation chamber, so I kind of learned my own unique style, which I'm passing on to you right now. All right, I'm back on this panel right now, and I've I've started to look down at the teeth, and I'm seeing a lot of overspray right in between the teeth. This is a good opportunity to get back to our positive stencil and just lay it in here. Now, if we can just line this up perfectly, we can go in with our dark mixture that we've been using and just spray this in fairly heavy. Now, this is a good time to spray straight up and down. This will keep our stencil registered down and keep the overspray off of our teeth. And we'll just pop this off. Now we have a really nice clean outline in there. At this point, we can grab our negative too. Now, I've done pretty good at saving my whites, but at this point, you might find that you've got a lot of overspray on your teeth. We can lay this back in and just spray back to the top, away from the stencil, and inversely come back the other way to spray the bottom row. Another thing you can do to modify these too, if you don't like your drawing, you can cut it and splice it. Like I could open his mouth down to here and make him laughing like crazy. And you can also scan this into the computer if you like to play with that and stretch them and push and pull them, reprint them off, cut those as stencils. So everything can work for you. You just try to push it out there a little bit. You can create a lot of new things from one existing one already. I'm just practicing here a little bit. I want to do some really tight stuff with this dark, so I'm just making sure i got a good flow going. As soon as I'm happy with what's going on, then I can take it onto the project. Right now, there's just a whole bunch of little eroded bumps, and I'm just creating a little bit of texture now to this guy. This is the fun stuff, especially if your brush is working well for you. So right now, just looking for all the nice little details, and occasionally, you know, a little crack in there might be kind of nice. He can look a little bit more on the grungy side, then he's just going to have that much more impact. Okay, it's time to address this reflection on the bottom side of our skull. So what I've done is I've got away from all the metallics. I'm into pure colors still. We're not going to put any metallics in here or special effects. So now what I have is a yellow with a little bit of red in it. Six, seven drops of a regular detail yellow with some detail flame red, keeping it very transparent. Just on the underside of anything that I feel it can get reflected back up. This is really good when you're doing chrome too, to kind of know how you think reflection and underlighting is going to hit everything. That means on the back of each tooth might catch a little bit. So just in this little bit that we put in, it's starting to fit into its environment. So let's increase the red value and we'll hit it again. I'm just going to chase the same areas as I did before, just slightly warming them up. Beautiful. I've changed and I've gone into a sort of like an ultramarine blue. It's uh, a fairly even blue. All I want to do is just highlight the top edge and around the back where this blue glow is coming in. And be very subtle. So I'm going to start, if I get overspray onto the background, I'm not worried about that. It's not going to change much. So I'm just going to tint it in there and just cool them off along this top edge. It's not going to hit a lot, but it's going to be enough to just show that that blue light is affecting them. I flushed out all my blue, and now I'm going to address all my highlight areas. This is where we get some shine to it. These things are really going to start making this thing sing. If you keep this going fast and you kind of know where everything is going to go, this process or this step can be fairly quick. We might choose to put an eye color in here, so I'm going to just give this guy a nice little glow instead of a, a ball in there. Give it a nice highlight burst and then just fade it out a little bit. I'm just looking for little ridges where the highlights are really going to come and punch out on. Okay, we're starting here. We put this white highlight in this eye. Now, by putting some color into this, this is going to bring this guy alive. So I put in a nice little lime green right now, and I'm going to reflect this all around the cavity around his eye socket. Now, I'm really careful that I'm going to keep that highlight bright, 
So I'm going to work away from it and just slowly into it. I'm just building this up slow. This is very translucent, but it has a lot of yellow in it. So I'm building up slowly, just like I did the yellow under the red, so it didn't go pink. And then I'll go to a darker green, and this guy is just going to glow for us. This is where you'll find when you take chances with some colors, a lot of things are really cool with them. I've mixed up some white with a little bit of green, and I'm just going to go in and chase that line there because it was fighting with the red. And since I have that in there, I'm just going to punch that eyeball area where it glows just slightly. That'll just give this nice glow effect out of it. I've got my green in here right now, just flying off that white, saving the highlight. There we go, he's coming to life. This turned out to be one tight skull. I really enjoyed doing this. I hope these tech tips really help you out. I'm Blake McCulley from Cross-Eyed Airbrushing. Thanks for watching.